Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and I wanted to bring you on a little trip that I took in August 2021. I meant to get this video out last year, closer to when I took the trip, but time did not allow me to do so. I visited four national parks in Ohio and one in Michigan on my journey to visit all the national park units. I left right from work and traveled to Parkersburg, West Virginia, where I spent the night, and the next day I entered Ohio. I drove to Canton, Ohio to visit the First Lady's National Historic Site. They have a couple of sites, but I went into the Visitor Center, which is inside of an old bank. The National Park Unit is dedicated to the First Ladies of the United States and features replica gowns of many of the First Ladies. At the park, I found a great respect for William McKinley's wife, who was born in Canton. Her parents greatly influenced her fight for women's rights and abolition. Ida's parents believed in women's equal status in the political sphere and sent her to obtain an excellent education not common to women of the Victorian era. Ida's home is preserved by the National Park Service, but I was unable to take a tour since it did not fit with my schedule. I was taking a weekend to visit five national parks and the limited time made this a quick trip, but it also lets me know what I need to do when I make a return trip. One of the coolest things about the visitor center being built in an old bank is the building's history. In the bottom of the building is the theater, where you can watch the park film. But that room used to be the bathhouse, when public baths were all the rage. But if it was in the bottom of the building, and no electricity existed yet, then how did they see down there? Well, one of the rangers there lifted up a part of the carpet, exposing a glass floor. The roof was also glass, which let in sunlight that reached through the floor of the bank into the bathhouse. That was one of the most interesting things on the trip. From there, I was off to Cuyahoga Valley National Park. It's basically located in Cleveland, and it preserves an incredible river valley area along an old railroad, which still operates for visitors. It started to rain while I was there, but I did get in a nice hike to Brandywine Falls and the communities which emerged along the river that now no longer exist. That park is a perfect combination of nature and history, with nature and history hikes available, as well as an awesome train ride through the park. From there, I traveled to Minton, Ohio, to the home of President James A. Garfield, preserved as James A. Garfield National Historic Site. As always, I watched the movie to get an overview of the park and the man whom the park memorializes. The house is spectacular, but no matter how amazing the inside is, I was attracted to the porch. Garfield essentially campaigned from his porch, giving speeches to groups of people. For the most part, Presidential candidates did not campaign. Senators, congressmen, and their campaign managers campaigned for them. But George Washington set the example of not campaigning to remain above the fray. Although Garfield did not travel, it did not mean he did not campaign. I will read this description from the National Park Service. Arriving at his mentor farm after his nomination at Chicago, Garfield was greeted by crowds of citizens. People who had known him for his days as a student, teacher, and Civil War officer came to wish him success. Newspaper reporters camped out on his lawn. Their accounts of the welcome Garfield received stimulated interest in his candidacy. Farmers and businessmen, college students and women, immigrants and union veterans, including a number of black veterans, came to see, came to hear, and came to meet the Republican nominee. In the little campaign office behind his home, Garfield and his aides exchanged letters and telegrams with the leaders of groups to fix dates and times of arrival and to exchange information so that when they met, a group spokesman and Garfield could address each other with appropriate remarks. From his front porch, he helped change the way presidential candidates behaved. That's not to say candidates did not campaign before him. Most notably, Stephen Douglas campaigned until the election night of 1860, but Garfield helped to facilitate that change with his front porch campaign. So that is why I was drawn to the front porch. It represents a change in American politics, and I am so happy that it is preserved by the National Park Service. From there, I drove to Sandusky, Ohio, and boarded a ferry to Putin Bay Island. It is now known mostly as a vacation destination on Lake Erie, but I was going for a different reason. The island is home to Perry's Victory and International Peace Memorial, preserved by the National Park Service. It memorializes the great victory of the United States over Great Britain in the Battle of Lake Erie during the War of 1812. The museum has an incredible collection of ship equipment and ammunition, as well as a park film that I highly recommend watching. You take an elevator to the top of the memorial, where you can view where the battle took place, as well as get a great view of Lake Erie and Putin Bay Island. The battle allowed the United States to control Lake Erie and represents a pivotal moment in American naval history. 
After returning to the mainland, I drove to Toledo to spend the night. After traveling around 350 miles and visiting four national parks in a single day. The next morning, I popped across the Michigan border to Monroe, where I got my picture with Civil War General George Armstrong Custer, one of the people who got me into history. Then I proceeded to River Raisin Battlefield, another War of 1812 battlefield. They just opened a new visitor center, which helps put the battle in perspective, and they have a wonderful diorama that caught my eye since I like to paint miniature soldiers. From there, I went to the battlefield itself. I took a short walk, but at the moment, not much exists for visitors to take in from the battlefield, but simply being in historic places makes me happy. From there, I drove the 400 miles home, completing my weekend. I hope you enjoyed this whirlwind tour of the four Northern National Park units in Ohio. Two years previous to this, I hit the four in southern Ohio, so now I have visited every national park unit in Ohio. I hope to do more of these trips as I get time to do them. Please check out the Patreon page to help support the channel, or simply share and like the video. It helps me out tremendously. Thank you all again, and have a great day.